been here for uh, the last couple of weeks. We've been in a series called Never the Same. And uh, here's the thing behind what we've been talking about. The idea is that when you get to know who Jesus is, everything changes. You will never be the same again. Jesus changes everything about us. When you truly get to know who he is and encounter him the way that the Bible talks about, the way that many of us have even experienced, things change. It's kind of like, how many remember Choose Your Own Adventure novels? Have you ever read the Choose Your Own Adventure books when you were little? Some of you guys are still reading. What's funny is I remember when I was a kid in elementary school and I mentioned them to my boys and they went and got them from their library and they were the same books. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. You're telling me no one can write a better Choose Your Own Adventure novel than like 30 years ago? I mean, come on. So, but if you remember those books, what was so cool about them is, is every time you got to a major part of the story, you got to make a choice about what happened right? Like, you're at this pivotal point. Do you jump off the cliff or do you climb down a tree? You know, do you wrestle the lion or do you fight the giant? You know, I, I don't know if those are actually things. I just, just give you examples. But you choose and whatever you chose changed the direction of the story. Now, I, I, it's interesting for me to notice that, that they're trying to update that some, that even Netflix has actually made an interactive TV show that's like that. Have you seen that? There's like a choose your own adventure movie TV show where like it gets to a point and you choose and it changes the direction of the movie. Um, so there's like even major guys like Netflix are working on this whole choosing your adventure idea. Now, if you're like me when you read those books though, like I would choose one adventure and read it to the end following that path, but then I would go back and reread the story and see what would happen if I went the other way. Because I kind of want to know, did I make the right choice, right? Did, did I make the choice that was actually where I wanted to end up or what would have happened had I made it a different choice? You know, where would the guy have ended up? Would he have married the princess or would he have been eaten by a crocodile? Like, you don't, you don't know what would have happened, right? So you want to go back and find out if you, the choices you made ended you, landed you where you wanted to be. And technically, I guess that's cheating, but, you know, whatever. No one cares. You can go back and read the story to see what happened to it. Now, when we're following Jesus, it's kind of like that same adventure that we're being called on to, but there's choice involved in that. Every single time someone encounters Jesus, they have to make a choice. And every time Jesus talks and we meet somebody, encounters them in Scripture, that person has to make a choice. What adventure they're going to choose. <laughs> are they going to choose the adventure of following Jesus with their life, believing in him, trusting him? Are they going to walk away and choose a different life? they land them someplace they have no idea. And so following Jesus is a lot like those choose-your-own-adventure stories. Choosing into the adventure of what does it mean to say yes to Jesus when you encounter him, because there's no in-between. You don't see anybody encountering Jesus and going, yeah, well, maybe, give me a little bit. It's always, I'm in, or they walk away. Because when we meet Jesus, we have to, there's a choice involved. Are we going to choose into this? And so today, we're going to look at a story out of the Gospels that, that presents two different people encountering Jesus, engaging with him in a way that they had to make choices to decide who they were going to be, what was going to come out of this. You know, and you and I, every single day, have choices we make whether, where we're going to end up. We make choices that are going to determine, are we going to follow Jesus or are we going to go our way? Are we going to continue on the adventure that God has for us, trusting him for the outcome, or are we going to decide, I got to do this my way and walk away from what he's presented to us? Because if you're sitting here thinking, listen, the stories we talked about the last couple weeks in the Bible, they're all well and good. They're great stories, you know, but I don't encounter God like that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't encounter Jesus the way these people encounter Jesus in my daily life. If you think that's true, you're wrong. <laughs> you encounter Jesus all the time. The problem is we just don't always recognize it. We don't see that this is a moment where God is giving us an opportunity to see him, to encounter him, to see ch lives changed. Every time you have the opportunity to be kind to someone and you do it, you're showing Jesus. Every single time you have the opportunity to, to, to cheat or not to cheat and you choose not to cheat, you're representing Jesus. Every time you come across somebody that you're showing love to, you're representing Jesus. Every time you recognize God's work around you, you're encountering God working. I've heard so many stories of people even recently with car accidents where it's like, man, I, I could have ended up crushed, but I didn't. And I look back at that and go, man, God was in that. He protected me. He saved me. And you look at that and go, man, Jesus was in that moment. Now, very often we can walk away from that and go, yeah, it was just luck or it was just coincidence, whatever, and miss God. But every single day, we have opportunities to encounter him in the faces of the people we come in contact with, and our children, and our coworkers, and our friends at school. We have the, the chance to encounter him, but will we choose 
to take those opportunities and see God work through them? Will we choose that adventure of following Jesus with faith? That's a good question. So as we look at this story, we're going to look at a story in Luke chapter 7. If you guys want to get your Bibles out, I'll have the scripture up here on the screen too. But Luke chapter 7, and, and one of the major ideas of the story I think that we're going to talk about as we see it is simply this. We won't recognize who Jesus truly is until we understand who we truly are. So many times we just kind of forget who we are, and we miss Jesus in the process. And we can't really get the full picture of how amazing Jesus is until we really understand who we are because of him. And so we're going to look at this story in Luke chapter 7 about people who engage Jesus. And I'm just going to read this straight through the, the passage, and we'll come back and talk about it, because I want you to get the whole story in context. And we'll come back and look at, look at what Jesus is doing here. But it starts in Luke chapter 7. It says, A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him, being Jesus, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. Denarii was just the, the, the kind of money they used back, back in biblical times. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. Whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say to themselves, who is this who can even forgive sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So you've got to understand this story. I wanted to read the whole thing straight through so you get the context of, of what is going on in this. You have three main characters in this story. Okay, you have the woman who came in, and, and, and Scripture tells us at the very beginning that she was a woman who lived a sinful life. Okay, it says that they're, they're, uh, the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, and so he went to the Pharisees' house, and he was, he was hanging out at their house eating, and this woman comes in who lived a sinful life in that town because she learned Jesus was going to be there. Now, sinful life here. We, you can, a lot of people will take that and try to run with it and, tell you, and say she was this, she was that, she was known for this. She had a, it doesn't really matter exactly what her, her sin was. She had a reputation, just put it that way. If you ever known anybody who's had a reputation, you can imagine this was not a good thing. It was a, it was a town, word got around, everybody knew who this lady was and they knew what she was known for and it wasn't good. It wasn't good. People didn't like her. In fact, she probably got used to people looking down on her. She probably got people used to people rejecting her. She probably got used to people spreading rumors about her, talking about her behind her back, you know, just being downright mean to her for all kinds of reasons. And she had this label on her where even people describing the story called her a sinful woman. <laughs> so she had this lifestyle that spoke loud and clear about what, her, what was going on in her life, the issues she had. And when she, and she comes into this house when she finds that Jesus is going to be there, and she's got this jar of perfume, which back then would have cost a ton of money. It wasn't just like she's got like, oh, we just, everyone carries perfume around. It's not like when sometimes as ladies you have stuff in your purse and you're just like spritzing and, and all that stuff before you walk into some place so you smell nice and flowery. Like it's not, it's not how this worked. Like when they had perfume, when they had that, it was a get, it was a lot of money this lady was going to put on Jesus right here because that stuff was really expensive. And she stood behind him it says, weeping intensely. The word here is not just like a little bit of like a sob, like, oh, I'm so upset. Like, this was like a, like a wailing, loud kind of cry where everyone in the room would have heard what was going on. You got to get this picture. Back in that day, you're like, why was this lady even, maybe you're thinking, why was that lady even in this story, right? Like, she, how did she get into the house? If it's a private dinner with Jesus and this Pharisee, where did she come from? In that culture, back in the day of the Bible, when they did stuff like that, it was an open, it was an open deal. 
It wasn't just like you came into my house and shut the front door, and unless you were invited, you weren't allowed in. It was an open experience for anybody who wanted to come, because Jesus was considered at least a good teacher by the Pharisees. Like, he was somebody who was well-known, and when somebody who was well-known would come to a house like that, it would be open for anybody in the community to come to. And those guys that were talking with, like, Jesus would be talking with the Pharisee, they would sit at the table and eat, and the community members would sit around the outside of the room, and they could come and go as they please just to hear what the, Pharisee, what the, what the teacher or the, the rabbi would be saying. So this was an open experience. It wasn't like we, we think of it now. So that's how this woman got in there. In fact, Scripture tells us she was there before Jesus was. She was waiting for him to get there. She knew he was coming. And so she's choosing to say, all right, I'm gonna, I, I, I need to meet Jesus. I need to get close to this guy. And she was so overwhelmed that her tears just started wa- on, dropping on Jesus' feet as he was reclined to the table. So his feet were kind of behind him. And this woman comes up, and she's just so overwhelmed to be in his presence. Her tears start to fall, and they start landing on his feet. And then she does something that would have been, you know, unthinkable in that culture. She takes her hair down, which was a sign of not being, you, you weren't allowed to do that if you were a woman. Your hair had to be up and covered in that culture. If you let your hair down, it said really bad things about you. She didn't care. She had her hair down, and then she used her hair to wipe his feet, wipe her tears and clean his feet. And then he starts kissing his feet and anointing them. And this isn't just a one-time deal. She doesn't do it once. The, the verbiage in this is over and over and over and over again. She's kissing Jesus' feet, and she's, she's weeping, and she's just so overcome with emotion. You got to picture that in that scene. This is not just a little like, oh, well, this lady's got issues, whatever. We'll ignore her. No, she is like in the middle of this room just loving on Jesus so extravagantly, probably making everyone else uncomfortable. Let's be honest. If you're in that space, you're probably going, this is awkward. Like, what's, who's going to say something, right? You know, and, and me, when I hear these stories, I hate feet. Let me just tell you something. Like, I, feet gross me out. I'm just telling you right now. Like, my wife knows this. Her feet are the only ones that I will rub, okay? The only ones, because I love her very much. We made a deal when we got married. I will rub your feet. That's it. I can't. Feet just, feet just skeeve me out. But then can you imagine this? I'm hearing this. I'm, I'm seeing this story, and this lady's not just, like, cleaning them. She's, like, kissing his feet. Oh, man, that's love. <laughs> like, that, that's, that, that's, that's love right there. Because you got to understand, back in that day, too, his feet would have been nasty. Like, they were. They were gross. Like, they, they walked everywhere. They just had sandals, and they weren't, like, Birkenstocks, everybody. They were, like, just, like, some, you know, very thin with some straps. They're walking everywhere on dirty, gross roads. And that's why... The customs when you come into someone's house in that day would have been to help give them water to clean their feet, right? Just to show appreciation of the person coming to your house, you would have had servants clean their feet or at least had clean water there so they could wipe off all the dirt and grime. And you would have, you would have given them a hug or a kiss on each cheek as a way of welcoming them and some, maybe some oil to put on their head because they've been walking and maybe they were sweaty and hot. And so it helps with all of that stuff. And so when Simon doesn't do that, it speaks loud and clear that he's not really interested in hosting Jesus. He's really there to test him for another reason. And we'll find that out in just a minute, but you've got to start with where this woman is coming from. She is so overwhelmed because of one simple thing. She chose to recognize her need, and that's where when we choose this adventure of encountering Jesus, it always starts there. It always starts there. We have to choose to recognize our need. We've got to see who we really are, what our needs actually are. This woman understood more better than anybody else probably, what it meant to be a sinner. She knew what it meant to be called a sinner probably by everybody that walked by her. She understood that label very, very well. And as such, she also understood the amazing truth of Jesus and the forgiveness that he can offer to remove those labels, to remove the stigma of her past, to remove the stigma of sin. But she knew first that she was indeed a sinner. See, she recognized her need And she responded to Jesus lavishly, loving on him because she knew that he was the only one that could meet that need. And she made sure that she was there to meet him, to thank him, to worship him because how much he had changed her life in this moment. And you see her as a character compared to the the Pharisee in this story who's like, listen, like this woman, like, like, yeah, she's got needs, obviously. Everyone knows she's got needs. But, like, I'm good. I'm a fair, like, I'm, I'm above it all. Like, I keep the stuff. I look at my house. Like, I dress nice. Like, I don't have any of those issues. I'm not one of those people. You guys ever 
caught yourself saying that about somebody else? Well, I'm not one of those people, right? <laughs> I'm not one, of, at least I'm not them, you know? Start to think that in our heart and our soul, and it, it reveals more about where we are with Jesus than you might even recognize. See, this woman chose to recognize her needs. She knew she was a sinner, and she knew Jesus was the only answer to that sin. See, Scripture teaches us that we all are in that boat of having that need. Romans 3 tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In fact, one of the greatest apostles in, in, in the Bible that wrote most of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, recognized this about himself. You've got to hear what he says about himself in, uh, in, in 1 Timothy. He says, but for this is Paul talking, but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, this is Paul talking, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the worst. This is Paul. If you were to think of anybody in the Bible that wouldn't need to say that, right? Sometimes you think, all right, well, it's, it's Paul. If anybody could have said, like, listen, I'm not like them at least, right? At least I'm not like all these others. Like, I'm, I'm better than that. Look at what Jesus has done through me. Look at what Jesus has used me to do. And he said, God, hold on a second. Out of all the sinners, I'm the worst. I have all of them. And it's only because of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness in me that can be put on display for everyone to see that it doesn't matter how bad you've been, how much you might consider yourself the worst of the offenders. Jesus can change that and show people through your life. And Paul's not trying to get you to be convinced that he's the worst in this verse, by the way. This is not like a, this is not like a battle to say, hey, like just, you know, I want you to think that I'm the worst. I'm trying to convince you that I'm worse than, I'm worse than you are, right? This is not a sin battle. <laughs> like, my sin's worse than your sin. Like, that's not, that's not what Paul's doing here. What he's trying to get you to see is, you know what? Paul's talking about himself, but he wants you to see is that very much you and I could be saying that verse ourselves. Like, we're, we're that same statement. It's, it's, it's like the woman. Like, we, we, the whole point of this story is not to feel bad for that woman. <laughs> not to feel like, oh, poor her. She has such a rough life. No, the, the whole point of what Jesus is talking about and when we're hearing this encounter with him is to say, man, that's me. Where, I, I can identify with that woman. <laughs> but if we're not careful, we'll forget what our need actually is. And we can start moving away and going, well, I'm not as bad as this person. I don't need forgiveness as much as that person needs forgiveness. And we can start to, our, our recognition of our need can start to fade. But as we get close to Jesus, he starts to show us more and more and more just how much we need him. Just how much we are all sinners apart from him. And only through him can that change. Only through him can we have the life that he offers us, eternal life. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis where he says this, the closer you get to the light, the more dirt you see on your shirt. <laughs> Love that quote because it's so true, right? You might think, I'm good with Jesus. I'm good. Like, I'm, I, I, I live a pretty good life. I'm a nice person. I, I pay my taxes on time, you know, and when I'm in a really good mood at the, at the grocery store, I put my cart in the cart corral. Like, I'm a good person, you know? Like, I do, I do the things that, you know, good people do. And, and you go, I'm, 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 me and Jesus, we're, we're okay. But as you get closer to him, as you choose into this adventure he calls you on, as he reveals more and more of who you are, we start to see more and more of how much need we have to continue to receive his forgiveness in our life, to continue to let him change us, to continue to, to, to point out just how extravagantly he has changed us, just like this woman, so we respond in kind. And we go, man, Jesus, like, I, I, ha I can't even control it around you because you've forgiven me so much. There's so much in my life, and I still have more that I have to come to you every single day and ask for forgiveness from. We are doing so much in my life. And as we get closer to him, he's so gracious and so generous that he points that stuff out to us. You might think that's weird. That's backwards. Well, it's not kind to tell someone what they're bad at or what, what's going wrong in their life. That's not what Jesus is doing. He's revealing where we are not like him and helping us move in that direction because that's who we were created to be. He's kindly pointing the things that need to be removed so that we can grow in our relationship with him and become more and more into the people we were created to be. So we've got to recognize our need. You see this woman who knew her need, and you see this Pharisee who had no clue that he had a need. And then when you choose to recognize your need, after that, you have to choose to respond to his forgiveness. As we're in this encounter, choosing this adventure, you've got to choose to do something with it. Once you know you're a sinner, once you know that you have stuff going on, you have a choice to make, right? 
get to choose either respond to what Jesus offers or choose to say, eh, I'm good, and walk away. We got to make a choice, though. And just like in this story, we see that Simon was not getting it. Because a lot of times we read the stories like this, maybe you've heard this before, and we think this is mainly about the woman. I don't think that's what the intention of this story is really all about. The woman is a story that points us to who Jesus is, but this story is really about Simon the Pharisee. Jesus does all the talking to him. This woman is there doing her thing. She's loving on Jesus. She knows how much she's been forgiven. She knows how much she needed Jesus. But really, this is about Simon's heart. And he, and he talks to Simon because Simon's like looking at Jesus and going, listen, all right, if he knew this woman was, he would not let her touch him. See, Simon was a Pharisee, and, and what you have to understand about Pharisees back then is they didn't like Jesus. Like, if you know nothing else about the Scriptures, the Pharisees didn't like Jesus. So for the Pharisee to even invite Jesus to his house for dinner was a big deal. Now, what I love about Jesus is he goes anyway. Like, Jesus will respond to any invitation. <laughs> He's like, you want to invite me? I'm coming, right? Whether I know you don't like me or whether I know you're going to try to trap me, I'm coming because you're inviting me. So Jesus responds to this invitation to this guy's house. And the Pharisee there, he's really just trying to test the waters to see if I need to actually pay attention to this Jesus guy. Because he'd heard that he was a teacher, and he'd heard that he might be a prophet. So when he says to himself, by the way, we read this story where it says, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner. So this is not like something that's announced in the room. This is him kind of off watching what's happening with Jesus and muttering to himself, like, yeah, if this guy was really a prophet, like, he would know this woman's messed up. He wouldn't have anything to do with her. So obviously, he's not a prophet, right? So he's rationalizing in his head who Jesus is. You know what I'm talking about? We do that sometimes, too. We just kind of like watching, and you're off like talking to yourself, thinking nobody can hear you. And you're like, all right, well, obviously, this person's got this going on. And so, you know, we start, we start telling those stories to ourselves. Simon's over here going, all right, well, I heard he was a prophet, but prophets would know this woman's a sinner, and a good prophet wouldn't have anything to do with sinners, so he obviously can't be a prophet, and if he's not a prophet, then he's probably not going to be the son of God, and therefore I don't have to listen to him. See the rationalization process that Simon's going through in this story? To say, I don't need to respond to this Jesus God because obviously he's not the son of God like he's claiming to be, and so I'm good. I don't need to make this choice. See, Pharisees, he, the word Pharisee by itself means separate. The definition of affairs, the definition of what that word means is, is separate. And so that's how he viewed what Christian living should be, separated from sin, separated from sinful people. Like you just stay away from those people. Separate yourself from those people. And so a good prophet or a good teacher in their eyes as a Pharisee would be someone who had nothing to do with sinners, nothing to do with unclean people, nothing to do with people who were messed up because they would know you separate yourself from that. That's how you stay holy. That's how you honor God is by keeping away from the bad people, keeping away from the, 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 the sinfulness. You don't want to get any of that on you, right? You stay clean, and then you're good with God. It's all about what you do to get God to love you. And that was, that was Simon's approach to life. And so to see Jesus letting this woman, who was obviously simple, touch him, kiss his feet, man, he can't be this. He would know better than that if he was the son of God. He wouldn't have anything to do with those people. And so if that's the case, I don't, Simon's going, I don't, need to, I don't need to listen to him anymore because he's obviously not the son of God because in my perspective of who God is, my God would never do that. He would get she's messed up, and God has nothing to do with those messed up people. Simon's whole response to Jesus was so skewed by his self-righteousness that he couldn't see that Jesus was sitting right in front of him, and he missed an encounter with God that was right in his face because he's had a, such a, he had a wrong picture of who he was. And so Jesus, I love what he does. He overhears. Well, I don't, actually, I don't think he overhears. I think he knows Simon's heart. And so he says, listen, Simon, I got something I want to tell you. So Simon says, tell me, teacher. Again, he doesn't refer to him as prophet. He doesn't refer to him as father. He's just teacher. He's like, okay, you, you probably, you've got some good advice. You've helped people out. Great. Tell me, teacher. So then Jesus starts a math word problem with Simon. <laughs> right? I love this. He takes, him to, he takes him to math class. He says, listen, okay, you're concerned with money. You're concerned with being right. Let's, let's, let's start a word problem here. You know, two donkeys leave Jerusalem. One's going 80 miles an hour. One's going 20. No, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't take that kind of approach, but he, he, he brings a math equation into this that Simon can understand. And he goes, okay, two guys owe a lot of money. One owes 50, one owes 500, neither can pay. So the guy who they borrowed from says, you know what, debt's forgiven. Who do you think would be more grateful? And Simon goes, well, I love his response. He goes, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Not the one who had the bigger debt canceled. He, I love how he says that, like, I suppose. 
Like, I guess if you really have to paint me in a corner, I would say probably the one. He knew where Jesus was going with that, I think, at that point. He's like, all right, but I got, I got to answer him now to save face. He knew what Jesus was pointing at. You're sitting here judging that woman, thinking like, oh, like what, what business does she have coming to Jesus? And you've completely missed your own sin. You've completely missed your own need for forgiveness just because you've, you've labeled her. He's like, it doesn't matter if you have a little bit of sin you think in your life or you have a ton of sin. We all need the forgiveness of Jesus. And he's pointing out to Simon and going, you're missing this thing. But he got the answer right. The one who had the bigger debt canceled is the one who would be more grateful, wouldn't they? And Jesus goes, you've answered correctly. And that's when he turns to the woman and points out what she did for him. And Simon's got to sit there and be thinking, okay, now what? This guy's in my house. He just kind of took me to school in front of everybody. Now what's he going to do? See, the woman responded to Jesus very differently than Simon. See, and we don't know exactly when she heard Jesus talk about forgiveness. It doesn't tell you that exactly. If you do a study of the Gospels, it probably was in a story that's not in Luke, but it's in Matthew. There's a way you can do it. It's called the harmony of the Gospels, because the Gospels are stories that are all taking place around the same times, written by different authors. And so a lot of them overlap in how they're taking place. And so when you do that, there's actually a passage in Matthew chapter 11 where Jesus says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And that woman was probably, this was shortly before Jesus comes to this Pharisee's house. That woman was probably in the crowd when she heard Jesus say that. She probably heard Jesus talk about coming to him, how he can give her rest for her soul, how he can change her identity, how he can give her what she's been looking for. And in that moment, she responded to it. It changed her. And out of that response, she couldn't help but when she met Jesus, just fall apart. She couldn't help but say, listen, man, he has changed my life. He gave me hope again. He, came, he gave me rest for my soul. He gave me physical rest, spiritual rest. I, gotta, I just got to love on this guy. So she shows up. She responded to Jesus forgiveness offered her. But Simon did not. He chose to go a different way. So as we encounter Jesus, we have to not only just recognize our need, we have to choose also to respond, but you also have to choose to remember who you are. Choose to remember your new identity in this whole thing. And this is how this story wraps up. I'm going to be done in just a minute with this, but when, when, when Simon answers Jesus' math problem, Simon, Jesus then turns to the woman and looks at her, and, and she's still kissing, wiping his feet. She's still doing all that, by the way. It's not like that's not, that's not like that stopped, and she's just sitting there listening to the conversation. She's still at his feet. So again, picture that situation, how uncomfortable it might make everybody else. This is an intense scene going on. She's still doing that, and finally Jesus turns and looks at her, but he's looking at the woman and talking to Simon, who's behind him. And he's like, do you see this woman? I came into your house— you did nothing to show me respect. You didn't give me water for my feet. She started wiping my feet with her tears and then wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman has been kissing my feet since the moment I came in. You didn't put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And at the end, he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, sometimes people can read that and say, okay, well, was it her amount of love then that she showed Jesus that saved her? No. Jesus makes it very clear that it was her faith that she put in him that led her to be so overwhelmed with love and appreciation and gratitude that she just fell at his feet worshiping because she knew she was different. She knew that it had been changed. That label of the sinful woman, that lady you avoid when she's walking down the street, that lady you switch over and you cover your kid's eyes, you don't want them to see her, that lady that all the township was talking about, they would have been posting on Facebook and would have had all these Instagram accounts about this lady. It, she knew that, and Jesus had changed that. Whether anyone else knew it or not, she knew it. And so she came to Jesus in that overflow, that overflow poured out of her eyes onto his feet because she had put her faith in that, and her love was a result of her faith in Jesus. And Jesus points to that and says, you see this lady? She took care of me when you didn't because she gets it. She knows how much I've done for her, and she can't help but have her love affect it. You don't get it, and so you didn't love me when I came into your house because you don't think you need my forgiveness. You don't think you need forgiveness. He didn't see his need, and it changed his whole view of who he was. So we need to remember when you encounter Jesus, when you come to him, and you re when you recognize your need, when you respond to him in forgiveness, it changes everything. It changes who we are. 
In fact, I don't have the verse up here, but, but Romans 8 tells us this. One of my, one of my favorite sections in Romans... I'm going to just turn there real quick. All right, Romans 8, 15. It says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with your spirit, with our spirit, that we are God's children. We move into a new identity. We move from being sinners. We move into being sons and daughters. Our identity changes because of Jesus. So when I tell you that you, ha- you won't really recognize Jesus until you understand who you are, it starts with understanding how much we need him. But then once you come to him, you have to understand who he makes you into. He changes everything about your identity. You are now a son and a daughter. You're not just a sinner constantly fighting for scraps from Jesus' table. You are brought into his kingdom as a son and a daughter. He's calling you to live like that and remember that so you don't return to those ways. This woman got that. She knew that her whole life was different and she couldn't contain it. And I wonder how many of us who have heard stories like this, who have heard the gospel over and again, who maybe even grew up going to church have forgotten that very message. I mean, think about this. When was the last time that you worshipped through tears because you just remembered how much Jesus has done in your life? When was the last time you came to church going, I just can't wait to sit at the feet of Jesus because he has changed so much about who I am? How often have we said, when we've seen someone who's been doing something wrong and we've gone, you know what? Well, at least I'm not them. A good test of where our heart is at and remembering who we are is when we look at someone who's sinning and our heart doesn't break for them, it we give sense, we get filled with a sense of, wow, well, I'm better, at least I'm better than that. Somehow we can see that we have switched from this woman to Simon, and we go back and forth. I can see myself in both of those things all the time. But Jesus is saying, remember who you are. When you choose this adventure with me, it changes everything. See, I, I, I knew a, I knew a, a girl um, when I was talking, thinking through this passage. When I was a youth pastor, there was a, a young girl um, in our youth ministry who was a high school student, and um, she, had got, she had gotten wrapped up in, in drugs and things like that while she was in high school, and she'd actually, at the high school she went to, OD'd while at school. Um, and so they had to rush her out of there and take her, and, you know, and so she ended up going to rehab through all that and walking through that whole journey as a high school student. But in high school, when something like that happens, it, it doesn't just stay quiet. You know, you know it's just like it, if it happened anywhere nowadays, but people, students were talking. And, you know, in, in her biggest fear, when she got out of rehab and she came to our youth group once, and I got to talk to her one, once or t- twice, you know, and I, I still pray for her all the time, her biggest thing was, I don't think I can go back there because they know what I did. That she had this label over her, kind of like the sinful woman would have had over her life, that she was like, all the kids knew, oh, you're the one who did that. You're the one who was that person who, who, had, who OD'd. You're the one who, who lived that kind of life. You know, and I would love to say when she showed up to church, when she showed up to the youth group and there was other kids there, that she still didn't have to face that, but that was the biggest struggle she had. More than anything else is the kids at church were the ones who were labeling her and, and looking at her like, well, don't hang out with her. Don't be anywhere, don't be near her. And she was on this journey of trying to figure out, okay, God, I, I'm reading your word and I'm believing that you can change things, but I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to encounter you in a way that, that, that I can actually break free of this label break free of what the people have been putting on me as I go around. And so she really struggled through that issue. She really struggled through this. She really struggled. She, she knew her need clearer than anybody. She's like, I've lived this. You know, and, and the fact is, is there was a lot of kids that were judging her that had the same need. They just didn't want to recognize it because they could cover it up well. And her stuff was out there. She's like, this, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. She recognized her need, and she's like, I'm trying to respond to Jesus, but, but it's like people won't let me live my new identity. Like people won't let me forget who I was. And she really struggled through this. And I remember one night being able to pray with her while we were on a retreat and just pray over her and say, listen, it, it doesn't matter the labels anyone else is putting on you. What matters is that when you come to Jesus and when you're like this woman and you see that he has done so much when you constantly remember that, you can drown out the noise of other people labeling, you can drown out all those things and you can just be free to move forward in your new identity as a daughter of the king, forgiven and strong and, how, and moving forward in that. And she had never heard it before. Or she'd heard it, but she never let it sink into her heart. And it was, it was huge for her. She just laid down the, I've been carrying this label, I've been letting people put this label on me, but I'm free because of what Jesus did. And I wish I could tell you I know where her story went from there, but I don't because she moved away. <laughs> 
Don't know where it went from there. But I know in that moment, she identified with that woman more than anybody I've ever met before and saying, I, I was this, but I know what Jesus has done for me. And now I know when I come before him, like I am worshiping like crazy, because I know, <laughs> I know, I know, I know who I was. And I know, I know, I know who Jesus is. And now that I see who I am, I can see him clearly for the first time in my life. And so that's this story. When we encounter Jesus, we have these choices to make. Will we choose to recognize we have a need for Jesus, number one? Will we admit that we need what Jesus has to offer? That we are all sinners. Nobody gets out of this life without that label. We're born into that, like Romans tells us. Everybody's born into that. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short. But will we come to Jesus, recognize our need, and respond to him in a way that says, okay, I'm going to respond to your forgiveness. And that label is going to be removed, and my identity is going to be changed. And I'm going to go from being a sinner to be a son and a daughter of the king and walk that out. So as we close, that's, that's what I want to challenge us with. And as the worship team comes back up, we're going to close with a song that challenges us to stand in the love of Jesus. And this is exactly what, this, what, what Jesus is talking to Simon about. He's like, when you, remember, when you know how much you've been forgiven, when you know where you've come from, it, you can love <laughs> greatly because you know how much you've been loved when we don't see our need correctly when we don't respond to jesus it's very hard to love the way jesus called us to love when he says when you've been forgiven little you love little not that you have a little bit to be forgiven of we all need to be forgiven the same amount but it's like when you recognize it it changes how you interact with people when you recognize who you are in christ and live in that identity it changes families it changes relationships it changes marriage it changes it, it changes cities, <laughs> changes society when we walk in that love and we recognize that and say, I'm going to look around me every single day for those encounters with Jesus. And I'm going to choose every single day to walk out that identity that, so that every time I see somebody, anybody that I can just remotely show the love of Jesus to, I can just remotely let them know how good he is because how good he's been to me. It changes everything around us, it changes who we are, it changes how we live our lives, it has an impact greater than you could ever imagine. So the challenge is, will you choose into that adventure? <laughs> will you choose into, into the things that we recognize how extravagantly Jesus has, has changed you, has worked in your life? Will you come to him with your need and go, I can't do this on my own? And accept his forgiveness and then receive your new identity? Or will you be like Simon, who's like, yeah, I, whatever. <laughs> you know, whatever, I'm good. I don't need this. I'm better than most people, and that's all, that, that's all I care about. Jesus is a loving, loving, loving father, and he, he draws us in gently and says, I've got more for you than you can ever imagine. Will you respond to him today and let him show that to you? God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the chance to be here. I thank you for the truth of your word, that you change everything. God, we, we can learn so much from this woman as we come to worship you, even as we close in worship, God. May you break our hearts in remembrance of who we are because of you of where you've brought us from, God. We don't stay sinners. When we come to you, we're forgiven and we become sons and daughters of the king. We're given a new spirit, a spirit of, of, of relationship with you, God. Give us the courage to live out of that relationship. Give us eyes to see where our needs are, where we need to come to you continually for forgiveness and cleansing and coming before you to be set free. And thank you for the work you've done. We never, ever, 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 ever forget just how amazing you are. Amen.